is this one? Yeah, okay, it's on. Thank you for the introduction. Um, yeah, I've actually been around a little bit longer than 15 years. I realize that's old data. Uh, when I started in the optical industry years, uh, several years ago, uh, two and a half gig DWM was the latest and greatest. And at that time, it was not existing in pluggable form factors yet. So you built two and a half gig on, I mean, large circuit boards with discrete electronics and discrete optics. A few years later, uh, the, the two and a half gig became available in SFP form factors. And it was a lot of research and discussion around 10 gig pluggable at the time. And it took a few years before that came out as well. And many people at that time uh, actually believed that 10 gig was the latest and I say the highest speed that you would ever get to in the pluggable form factor for two reasons. One, related to technology, that uh, it was supposed to be too difficult to go higher up in bitrate than 10 gig and run it over fiber over any type of distance. Uh, the other aspect was the capacity. Uh, I had many colleagues at the time that said that uh, 40 times 10 gig, that's going to be enough. Uh, no one needs more capacity than that. And that was really what they believed. Today, you can do that in a small pluggable form factor of 400 gig. And that's what I'm going to talk about here today. So I will talk about some of the challenges and the opportunities uh, when deploying those pluggable form factors. What I will go through here is a, a quick intro to the technology and uh, some of the market outlooks for it. And then uh, some of the transmission challenges that we see and that we have experienced now when we've started to deploy this over the last year. And last but not least, uh, some of the optical performance examples that you can expect from this technology. Uh, so if we look at 400 gig, uh, then the pluggable uh, aspect of it, how can that be used? Uh, if we have some kind of transport network, you need something if you're going to do wavelength multiplexing. It could be passive filters, point-to-point, -point, road down, whatever it is. I'm not going to talk and focus on that. But you can use the pluggable optics in two ways. The, if I call it the traditional way, where you use, uh, in that case, typically CP2 in a transponder and max bonder and run it um, as, as you've done in the past with transponders and so on. I'm actually not going to talk anything about this. What I will focus on is the IP over DWM, where you put uh, the primarily then OSFPs and QSFP DDs, uh, 400 gig, in your routers uh, or your switches and run it over kind of an open line system. That's something that we see a lot of interest in, and we see a lot of question. People uh, have an interest to understand, how can I use this? Can I take benefit of the lower cost uh, that comes with this technology and so on? So that's what I'm going to try to focus on. Uh, there are a lot of, if I call it, uh, discussions around 400 gig versus uh, 400 ZR plus. What is that and uh, how can that be used? 400 ZR, that's a standard that is standardized by OIF. It's a very well-defined standard. Uh, it's defined and designed for point-to-point -point application. Uh, it has a very, I say, uh, well-defined um, standard in all aspects, not just, uh, I say, optical interoperability. That is one part of it. So the standard will allow you to use vendor A on one side, vendor B on the other side, and they will talk together, uh, talk with each other, so you will have a full optical interoperability with them. But they are also standardized on the electrical interface. That means if you have implemented support in your router for vendor A, you are supposed to be able to take anyone else's optics as well, put it in into your router, and it's supposed to work, because it's defined that way. But uh, last but not least, it's also defined on the register map or the EEPROM data uh, where you should store information and how that data should be exposed and how you should be able to present that data. So that means if you've implemented support for whatever, OSNR measurements in, uh, from vendor A, the same information should be found from, from, say, another supplier at the same register and the same access way. So that means you actually get a true uh, possibility to use, uh, as I say, commoditize this and use one, uh, as a standardized type of optics. This actually works quite well when it comes to the 400ZR. However, the 400ZR Plus, that is not a standard. 400ZR Plus is uh, kind of a uh, buzzword that people are using uh, that uh, covers kind of an umbrella of different, uh, that falls under an umbrella of different uh, MSAs or initiatives. I just took some examples here, the Open ZR Plus, Open Rodem, Open XR, some examples of initiatives around it. 
One thing that all of those have in common is that they have the open in the name. That means they are intended to be used in the switching router and, and used kind of as an, in an open philosophy. What we've seen so far, I mean, first of all, they are more complicated, or I should say they have more capabilities. So you can use them for more than just point-to-point. -point. You can actually use them for also in rodent-based network and more compli complicated networks as well. Uh, what we see today, uh, the only thing that is available today uh, in the form factor that you use directly in the switching router uh, is the open ZR+. Uh, so that's GA and a roll, a rolling out in fairly large volume. It works very well. However, uh, you need uh, to have a host implementation. So if you, you use this on a, on a router from one vendor, it may or may not work on a different router uh, manufacturer because it all depends if they have implemented support for this or not. So that makes it a little bit more tricky. Uh, you cannot necessarily say that it will work. Uh, you also see another thing there that uh, uh, there are a lot of different, um, say, the specification is standardized by this uh, uh, C, uh, CMIS, uh, Common Management Interface uh, Specification. And there are multiple flavor of it. So for the ZR Plus, you have some people, they are, uh, implementing it based on the 5.0 specification. Others are using 5.1. And then there is a coherent version of the CMIS as well that some people refer to. So it is kind of a jungle there to get that, uh, uh, say, get, uh, have full control of what kind of capabilities you have. Uh, how are those optics then supposed to work when you plug them in? Well, it's a kind of a smart, a smart way of, of uh, using the technology. So the, there is an area in the uh, unit or in the devices that specify what kind of application they support. I take an example here now of an open setup plus. Don't worry, I'm not going to go through this table. I'm just going to uh, explain the principles around it. But you have, um, uh, in this particular case, you have 14 application modes that this unit is uh, supporting. Uh, you have three of them. Uh, they are the ones that are defined by OIF. Uh, the most commonly used for routers is that they use the 400 gig version of it using CFEC. That's the standard OEF version, and that works in uh, the majority of the routers that support uh, 400 gig today. Uh, that means you have a certain performance when you run it in that mode based on what you have configured it for. It only works with 400 gig on the, I say, on the host side, so you cannot use that in a max bond or anything like that. It is true transponder functionality or whatever you call it when you put it in the, uh, in the router. If you want more capability, you can also run it, if I, I call this now a uh, transponder 400 gig mode, if your router support it, you can set it up instead to be used with uh, another application mode where you get OFEC, still 400 gig, still same electrical interface, but you get much better uh, optical performance from it. Then you have some other pretty cool features that you can use. Uh, like max bonder capabilities. So for example, uh, application mode six, uh, it gives you four individual 100 gig uh, client or host interfaces. So you can now start to use that in a four by 100 gig, um, say layer one um, transponder or max bonder type of application. If you want to go further, you can go down in line rate, run it at 300 gig on the line side and multiplex three by 100 gig into 300 gig and get better optical performance and so on. So this is how the, say the, the, the standard and the, the, the idea behind it. You plug it in, the router reads what kind of capability does this optics have. It presents its own capabilities to the user that then set it up and configure it to work according to what you want to use it for. That's the idea behind it. Uh, I will come back to our experiences so far on what's been implemented and not in the routers today. But this is how it's supposed to be, be working. Uh, so it's a pretty smart way of, of dealing with it. Uh, are people using those optics nowadays? Well, yes, they are. So uh, uh, Acacia announced here at OFC that they have now deployed 50,000 units of um, 400, I call it here now CRX, uh, any type of 400 ZR in IP with DWM application. Uh, so last year it was about 50,000 deployed. Going a few years back uh, forward here in time, uh, it's expected to go up to about half a million per year at 20 in five years from now. So it's clearly something that is going to happen, and we see a fairly large uh, interest not only for the hyperscale guys, but also for operators and for uh, service providers in general. So how can we 
take benefit and utilize this new technology uh, by using IPO with DWM. So and, uh, the other curve here shows uh, the 400 gig or 400 gig plus used in transponders and max bonders. So that could either be discrete uh, circuit port that you plug in into your DWM system or like a CFP2 that you use together with a more traditional uh, transponder, max bonder. So this is uh, based on uh, signal AI's um, analytics, so it's um, th their view of the world at least. So that's the introduction to 400 gig. If we then look at some of the challenges, uh, so when can you use this and how can you use uh, this technology? Uh, I, w I will start with one challenge that's related to the bandwidth of those uh, signals. So uh, I do get quite a bit of questions on how they can fit into a kind of a passive infrastructure. Uh, so there will be challenges if you're going to run this over a passive network related to the bandwidth. If you run an OAF 400 gig, it's somewhere about 60 to 65 gigahertz uh, wide, depending a little bit on the shape of it. Uh, and if you run it in open ZR plus mode, it goes up all the way to 70 gigahertz. So it's a fairly high uh, bandwidth that it requires. Uh, if you run them in 100 gig mode, then you actually run a different modulation format. So then you get a much narrower signal that can actually be used uh, in a much better way in legacy or existing networks. But if we then look at, for example, a thin film filter. So if you have any type of, say, four channel, eight channel DWM filter out in the field, uh, it's very likely that they are built with thin filter technology. They typically have a specification where they give a clear passband of 30 gigahertz, equivalent to just shy of 60 gigahertz uh, 3dB bandwidth. So that means uh, you will not be able to run the 400 gig through your existing filter network without a penalty. It may or may not work, but you will get the penalty. So that is, of course, an issue. Uh, another technology to be used are AWG filters, but then you typically have a higher loss. So then you will not actually be able to get any optical budget because the optical budget that you have when you run those passive is 11 dB. And worst case uh, numbers for a, for a standard 40 channel max D max is about 12 dB. So you will not even be able to go outside of the house uh, with, with the transmission. So that is not a good solution either. So is there any solution to this? Well, of course, there are new filters coming out on the market with higher bandwidth. So if you want to do an eight channel filter today, no problem. But it is for green field deployments. So if you have something in the, in the field today, it's very likely that you will have penalty and challenges to get 400 gig to work over that. That's something to be, uh, oh, to be considered if you want to start to use this. Uh, but if you buy a new solution today, I think uh, pretty much every vendor today qualify or have qualified wider uh, filters as well so that you can fit in 400 gig there. So that's one of the challenges. Uh, another challenge is related to the TX power. This is something I heard several people mentioning yesterday. So the, t the specification today uh, only provide a very low TX power. Uh, and uh, somewhere around minus 10, hello, minus 6 to minus 10 dBm for the uh, OEF version. The open ZR plus can be even worse, uh, down to minus 13, depending on how uh, the router configured 400 gig. So you can, you can play around with different settings, pole shapings, enable, disable, and so on, to get to the minus 10 at least. So you get, a, I, say, I shouldn't say good, but a decent TX power. Minus 13 is really poor. They don't have any tunable optical filters inside either. Uh, at least not the pluggable form factors that you use in the routers directly, so the DDs or the OSFPs. That means you will have limitations on uh, running, the, uh, running them in a, if I call it, a coupler-based uh, a CD network, but I will come back to that here later on. So the consequence of this is that you can typically get them to work if you build a network from scratch. Uh, you can actually build quite advanced networks, even rodent-based networks, with those, say, TX power constraints if you do it in a smart way. However, it's very likely that you have issues with uh, your existing deployment. And that's because you have some, say, requirements there on the, on the green field that, that puts limitations to it. If I take, I mean, a standard RODEM implementation, expect to have a TX power from the transponder of zero dBm. That's typical what, what they are designed for. They will have some kind of dynamic range, maybe plus minus four dBm, or dB in that case. So um, like minus uh, four to plus four dBm, uh, uh, 
possibilities. So if you shoot in something that goes with minus 10 into a row them that expect my uh, zero dBm, you will get a very, very heavy penalty. It, m it might not even work. So that's not a good idea. Another issue then when we don't have any tunable optical filters is that if you have a colorless um, uh, rodent based installation today where you have, uh, say, couplers, so you um, use the say the greatness of coherent technology where you basically take uh, multiple wavelengths going into a receiver, you tune in to the receiver that you want to listen to, uh, so you can actually, I mean, that coherent crosstalk uh, uh, is not an issue for a standard. Uh, <laughs> Uh, coherent receiver, but it is for the for those uh, today, so that you will have limitations on uh, what you can do there. You can mix up to four wavelengths uh, without getting too much interference. Uh, and another problem then is that uh, we see a lot of uh, customer that has deployed 50 gigahertz systems. So many people wanted to be future proof here 10 years ago and uh, have room to grow to 80 channels or 88 or whatever they used at the time. And now they are suffering from that because then you have the bandwidth constraint to it. So how can we overcome those? Yeah, well, there are some good news. There will be new uh, flavors of the ZR Plus coming out later this year. So there will be units with a higher TX power. Basically, there are two technology choices. Either you use a micro edfa within the optics or you use other materials like indium phosphide to get higher TX power from the modules. They will be available now second half this year. They will also come with or without tunable optical filters, so you can better fit them into an existing uh, colorless environment. And last but not least, they will also be allowing you to do more configurations. So you can run, for example, uh, 200 gig in 16 quam, meaning that you will have a narrower bandwidth, so you can fit them into a 50 gigahertz window. So then you can still utilize this new technology that provides the, the cost benefit of it, uh, but uh, fitting it into your existing network. So that part is good. Then the question is, are they going to be supported in your, uh, your selected routers? So what I try to do here is to try to summarize our, our experience from what, uh, what we've seen so far. Uh, I would say pretty much every single uh, router vendor that we've tested with the OEF version works if they have implemented support for it. So that seems to be very well, say, proven out now. There will be, of course, some, some say, constraints. You need to have the right software. Uh, in that sector out there that support the coherent optics. And of course, uh, some of the suppliers or uh, router manufacturers have selected to only, as I introduce this to certain blades or to certain platforms. So you have to make sure that it supports it, but it typically works very well. When it comes to the open ZR Plus, it may or may not work. So there is all about what that supplier have implemented support for. We've tested successfully with the majority of the vendors, but it's a very, say, different feature set that they support. So in many cases, they only support 400 gig OFEC, but uh, none of the other capabilities are supported. For quite obvious reasons, uh, so I will take that as an example here, uh, Cisco has done a good implementation of this because their acquisition of Acacia, so they have um, together worked out a pretty good implementation for it. So we've tested uh, some pretty cool configurations there that works really well. So what I want to show here is one thing that I think could be really, really interesting to provide a good migration plan for many of you guys, because what, uh, what we see is the, I mean, the majority of the service providers in Nordics, they are still sitting with 100 gig interfaces at most, uh, not that many 400 gig ports. How can we then take, take benefit of this newest technology? Well, you can always run it with some kind of layer one max bonder. Uh, there are a few flavors out on the market that uses uh, QCFP DD on the line side uh, and more kind of gearboxing functionality inside, so 4 by 100 into 400 gig. And then when you do it that way, then you have the benefit of being able to migrate uh, one site at a time. So if you now have 100 gig, you can start by the deployment on top. Once you want to upgrade, you probably upgrade your, say, the central site to 400 gig capable router uh, as the next step. Then you take the most expensive component, the 400 gig pluggable optics, 
and move it directly to the router. So you don't have any stalled investment from what you would if you had a CP2. And later on, uh, once you upgrade your entire uh, router park to 400 gig, you can then move the other, uh, the other optics as well. And then uh, you can repurpose the, the, um, the coherent optics in a very, very efficient way. So this is something that we've seen a lot of interest uh, from the industry from. We've tested this uh, with uh, um, Cisco uh, successfully. Uh, but there are not that great implementation from the other router vendors today, so it's uh, very different from supplier to supplier there. So that was my last slide on the challenges. Uh, if we then look at the optical performance, that's another question that I typically get. How far can you take those and how well do they work? So what I've tried to do here is to summarize some some data in a couple of slides. So what we've done, we've assumed a number of things there with I see the amplifier specification just to set the, ball, ball, uh, uh, um, set the stage. So a very standard type of amplifier line system to be used in this, uh, those simulations. I used a specification from the OpenZR Plus optics that, um, uh, that exists today on the market where the OEF uh, has an OSNR limit of 26 dB. Uh, the 400ZR Plus, uh, running it with OFEC, has uh, 23.4, etc. Uh, when you run those amplified without any line amplifiers, uh, the specification says, says 80 km. However, if you do the math and calculate it, uh, you will see that you can easily do 120 km uh, based on, I say, the input power, OSNR, and so on. So 120 km we feel very comfortable with in all the testing with a uh, pretty good margin. What the supplier of the optics state is that they state 80 km if they are, say, used together with someone else. If you use supplier A here, supplier B on that side on the optics, then they only commit to 80 km. If you use the same supplier on both sides, then they commit to 120. So you will have to check uh, with your supplier or uh, what, what they can guarantee if you want to run it in a point to point like that. But 120 looks, uh, works quite well. If we then add some line amplifiers, then what I did here, I did some simulations and I realized when I looked at it earlier that I uh, did make those, um, uh, whatever you call it, uh, the number of hops that they support a little bit wrong. Uh, so <laughs> I apologize for that. But so the way that this is supposed to work then is that you look at the um, simulation. So if you run five, uh, five hops, you have an OSNR at 26.2, that's the required OSNR. And the OSNR limit for 400ZR is 26, so that actually works. So the number there, up there, should be, as a, uh, th that's the lowest possible number that you're allowed to go. So basically, you could go five hops with 400 ZR with inline amplifier when it comes to the OSNR uh, limitation. Then OEF also specify a very narrow uh, dispersion compensation window that goes up to 140 km. So that means then you cannot do the five hops anyway, unless they are very short. But uh, uh, that's uh, also something you have to take into consideration. The ZR Plus works much better, so they have much better uh, dispersion tolerance. So then you can actually go, I would say, substantial distances uh, over a solution like that, uh, amplified point to point with inline amplifiers. Maybe more important and more interesting is how well does it work in rodents. So in this case now, we have made this simulation based on the low TX power optics, running it in rodents that are, say, designed to handle that, so they don't get any penalty from the lower TX power. So this is not going to be a brown field. This is a green field uh, deployment if you use rodents that are, <laughs> say, taking the lower TX power into consideration. Then you see you can go um, uh, same same. Uh, say data here, you can go two hops basically with 400 ZR. You can go five hops with 400 ZR plus when you run it in 400 gig mode with OFEC enabled. In a network like that, and why can we go less hops here? Well, a rodent consists of one preamplifier and a booster amplifier, so you have twice as many amplifiers contributing with, with noise. So that's why, why you have shorter distances here compared to the other one. Uh, but what you can see here now in a network like that, if everything would be theoretically looking exactly like that, you can actually get any to any connectivity uh, in a network with uh, up to six rodent sites uh, by using 400 gig. So it actually provides pretty good um, uh, say performances for metro networks. So it is definitely something that, uh, that will generate a lot of interest and uh, we, we see from our side 
um, everyone is asking and uh, have a, um, an interest to understand how they can take benefit of this. So that was my last slide. Okay. <laughs> thank, thank you, Kent. Uh, do you have any questions uh, in the room or via Menti for Kent? Okay. Either okay. I was crystal clear or no one understood. I don't <laughs> know. <laughs> uh, microphone to Michael, please. D just uh, uh, what vendors, uh, ZR uh, plugs, OF ZR plugs, did you test? How, how many different vendors? Uh, on the OF, we've tested three different ones. And on the OpenZR Plus, we have, um, uh, we've tested one that complied to the OpenZR Plus. Uh, that's uh, okay. And then we've tested one additional one with ZR, say, proprietary ZR Plus capabilities. Same performance, but a little bit less uh, configuration capabilities. Yeah, I was m mostly wor worried about the the registers and the configuration side yep. of them. But so for the ZR, okay, because there are more there on the market. But thank yep. you. Yep. On the ZR Plus, it's messy. Uh, on the ZR, it's looking pretty promising, I would say. So <laughs> from what we've seen. Okay. Well, if there are no further questions, uh, please join me in thanking Kent for his presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you.